So, this conference will now be recorded. Okay, so recording started. Um, so welcome everybody. Um, and my my talk is um, a, a, a bit of a fast ride through what Ballastless Track is, which I'm sure most of you kind of do know, but I'll I'll, I'll do that. But that's going to be pretty pretty fast through that. Um, what I will also touch on is sort of the whys and wheres and, and the challenges, which I think are interesting to just sort of uh, mention um, as we pass uh, through, because, you know, Ballastus Track doesn't get used that much, uh, but it's good to know a little bit more about it and the, and the whys and the wherefores. Um, I'm also going to focus on a couple of recent projects in Europe, um, just to sort of give a bit of a flavour of state of the art of what's going on um, uh, elsewhere. Uh, and delivered by uh, some of my colleagues in Germany and Switzerland. Um, and I'll finish with um, a bit of a, a rapid circuit through a couple of projects cu currently going on in, in Britain itself. So you'll get a bit of a flavour of, of, of a few different things. OK, so I do have a slide, if it moves on. There we go, um, which is a, sort of a synopsis of it. And what I haven't really said is what, what I do and what, what my role is. So I'm the chief engineer at Rombeck Sursa UK. And that means I kind of have uh, oversight on both the sort of design and construction phases of things. Um, I've also spent the past few years um, leading our way through um, some fairly complicated um, design deliveries and now uh, on-site deliveries of works, um, which has been um, quite challenging and have learned a lot of, uh, as, as we've gone along. Um, and this talk kind of reflects a little bit of that, but but really gives a sort of a broader view of, of where things are at in, in various ways. So first off, I'm going to, as I said, going to do a bit of a rapid run through what what it is. Um, why or where does it become um, maybe sometimes the only, if not the best solution um, and outline some of the challenges that, that are involved. Um, like I said, I'll then go on to some some projects and describe those. And the elephant in the room, I'm not going to mention ATIS2. So what is it? Well, simply put, ballastless track is a track where ballast is not used as a structural element. Occasionally you do see it. So the picture on the right shows what looks like some ballast down the side. Um, here it has a function more of kind of water attenuation and drainage, uh, somewhere to walk um, and or somewhere to um, in theory, absorb noise rather than reflect noise, or maybe it's just cheaper than pouring concrete everywhere. Um, but but the, the key thing is the structural function. Um, the rails are therefore fixed to what is essentially a, a nominally permanent structure, which has to therefore be designed. Um, and that design process is where it really differs um, in, the, in the putting together of a, of a design for a um, track compared with a ballasted track. Um, the system is then designed um, according to circumstance, so depending on whether you're in a tunnel, on, on a bridge, um, on earthworks of whichever form, uh, that will then dictate what exactly you have to, to do in terms of design in the, in the substructure. The term slab track um, is used an awful lot. I use it pretty much interchangeably. The official word in the standards, though, uh, certainly at European level uh, and international level, is ballastless. Um, which does confuse sometimes. So um, I'm, here's the rapid run through. So I generally try and talk of it in terms of a sort of three layer concept. Um, you don't always need all three layers. It all do, does depend on the circumstance. But in principle, here, here we go. And I'm going to use um, the Radar 2000 in situ track system as, a, as my example um, to, to explain this. So in essence, my three layers are the top one, which has the fancy bits in the fastenings uh, where the rails are held um, and, the, and the bits that um, hold them in place, uh, gauge, etc. Um, the second layer, which generally I'm, I call the foundation layer, and then a third layer, which is whatever you have to have underneath. Um, often that may well be a tunnel floor or something like that, a tunnel invert. Um, in earthworks, it can be depending on you know how that's been put together, but it, it, it often is a some sort of granular protection layer, uh, etc. So, going from the bottom to the top, what do they really consist of? Well, it, it kind of all depends. What depends what's underneath, and it depends what's going on top. So, depending on 
what you'd like to build on top and some customers have strong preferences others just want to know what might fit best or be the cheapest um, often it's driven these days by you know what can be built the fastest um, so so there is a trend away from in situ track forms but in essence this is the the, the full sort of concept so this base layer um, as indicated here um, is fulfilling a number of functions um, if you're on soils it might be a frost protection layer um, it might well be something like a type one fill um, it will have to incorporate whatever drainage under track crossings etc that you might need um, and it may be um, a bound fill depending again on what is the circumstance um, that you're building um, the foundation layer um, has quite a lot of variations to it as well depending on uh, what what where you are and, and what the top layer needs um, it it may be um, reinforced it may be unreinforced it may be asphalt it might be concrete um, and essentially the the key objective is it's providing a working platform as efficiently as possible structurally um, in order to put the the top layer on so you know it's it's easy to sort of get into a lot of details on that but it, it really is uh, horses for courses um, and the top layer which gets a lot of the sort of publicity and the focus um, is also relevant because whatever you pick there does drive what your needs are elsewhere um, in this case you know you can see in its various parts there's a sleeper part there's then reinforcement parts there's then a wet concrete part um, some of the examples later show this in a, a little bit more detail of how you get there and what you do with it um, but in essence, depending on what the system you pick, um, it may be um, continuously reinforced um, or it may be discrete slabs. Um, it can be done in situ, could be precast. Um, and it, it may re require a, a makeup layer. So if it's a precast element, for example, you, you, you may still be pouring um, a wet um, layer underneath that. Um, with most of the in-situ sleeper type systems you're pouring a, a, a larger matrix of in-situ concrete um, and there are systems now that don't that only have a, a small amount of grouting required which reduces the amount of wet works on site so there's there's a number of variations which um, according to your needs um, can can be uh, deployed um, and this slide is some of those little diagrams just blown up a little bit more just to illustrate those um, and you, know, you can see the, the sleeper elements, they are a single unit um, on top of the, the foundation and the, the, the layer on Oh, I just a lot. I beg your pardon, are you, am I still audible? Yes, you are, Barnaby. Sorry, yeah, I, I heard a, a question there, I wasn't sure. Um, so the, the, the next, slides are about the why um, why would you do it well the the most projects I would say around 50% of the sort of things we're getting involved with at the moment are to do with electrification so they're about fit they're about lowering the track how do you get that fitting where say in a tunnel uh, the tunnel gets tighter as you go down um, so narrow width uh, track forms are of, of sort of the essence at the moment um, fixity helps with gauge clearance um, other projects are about sort of golden asset type things. So where there really is a demand for sort of having something lower maintenance um, and, and improved um, reliability and availability. Um, that's the kind of stuff that's that's driving something like HS2 um, to go to, to slab track. Um, and of course, when it's new infrastructure, that's a slightly easier decision as well. Um, so, you know, we, we have a mix of projects from new build to refurbishment to ballast replacement. So um these these all transpire according to those various sort of driving business 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 needs at the end of the day though uh, you should end up with good high quality geometry to give a, a, an improved and smoother ride which should be durable um, here's a brief glimpse at our king's cross remodeling project example which has had its own um presentation so i'm, I'm not going to go into massive depth here but uh, one of the key drivers on that was uh, essentially um, track being put as low as it could be in, the, in a, an existing old tunnel in order to um, put track in a tunnel that hadn't had track in it for a while and with electrification um, essentially 
sleepers could not fit. Uh, in the end, we've we've had a track slab with, which is only 2.1 meters wide, uh, and that fits. And even that required a, the slightest of shavings off the off the corner of the the tunnel, not as big as is shown in this design drawing, but uh, in order to actually get it to fit. Um, so it just goes to show that that you know 2.1 meters wide is 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 pretty damn narrow for the, the top part of the track superstructure. Um, so various things are possible these days. Um, other things that I think are worth sort of mentioning heading towards sort of the whys and wherefores are um, the environment. Um, we're, we're quite sort of um, engaged with sort of trying to look at the, the, the reasons why and what you have to do to, to keep with um, the world and reduction of carbon is one of them. Um, noise is another one so environmental noise in, in curves where you've got jointed track potentially if you want to eliminate CW, uh, you want to do CWR and eliminate joints um, Ballister's track is a way to do that uh, but you've got to still consider the, the wheel row interaction. Um, safety is another reason um, there are things that are slightly different um, with with Ballister's track construction um, Risks to be managed, typical are the materials, a lot more sort of concrete and cement stuff. So, you know, that's a that's a different to, to ballast, although ballast obviously has dust questions as well. But things like, you know, pre-carved slabs are great, but you've still got man-machine interface and lifting operations. Um, so, you know, similar to, to um, most track works where you've got all the machines working, um, you've still got to consider those in your, in your management of construction. Um, Opportunities, however, are that the key sort of safety risks leading to derailment are all either eliminated or reduced in, with the use of Ballister's track, um, mainly because the track being a, a slightly more substantial structure underneath um, doesn't give way so the rails are held better even if the rail uh, were to break. Um, but that does mean that you've got to have designed it properly and to, to guarantee that for the full design life. So the the a quick sum up of what the challenges are and, and, and what's therefore involved are um, capex costs are usually a little bit higher than you expect for for a ballastic ballastic construction and particularly where the the lengths of track involved are quite short you, it's very hard to um, come up with maximum efficiencies if you're only building a few hundred meters or something. Um, and that has been the case, and it and therefore puts your unit uh, price um, up. Um, so efficiency gains um, are important to sort of consider from that point of view. Um, there's also been some historical failures. The image here is of Kentish Town, where the drainage underneath stopped working for um, a variety of reasons. Um, and although that track had actually survived 40 plus years, um, that you know that was still a, a problem that was that was a, a challenge to to rectify. Um, there haven't been standards. That has been another challenge. There is now a, a European standard. Um, I I confess to having been on the the committee drafting it. I also confess to leading the UK uh, committee to vote vote against its publication because we didn't feel it was quite ready when it was published. Um, we're now working with it, and we would hope to improve it in the future. Um, um, and the the available products, um, there's quite a range of things that are available and, and accepted by Network Rail, um, but they all don't all do the same thing. Um, and understanding them is is pretty key. Um, and there are a few different things and new things around which which are definitely of interest for for speed of build and efficiency of of, of structure. Um, I mentioned briefly in the chat before we started, um, Ballister's track is is track. However, because of the nature of the, the civils part of the, the design process, there is quite a challenge to getting the design process um, done and approved um, in a really correct way. Um, things like, you know, what constitutes an independent check um, is a pretty key question. And I have come across some confusion um, in my uh, career over that. Um, in, in particular, it comes down to you know the difference between what a, a civils independent check looks like and what a track independent track uh, check looks like. Um, who who should do it? Who's qualified to do it? Even 
Um, so we've ended up actually with, with um, an additional CRE category of a CRE for slab track, which is not in the standards, but um, is effectively what's been created um, as a solution to um, supporting uh, both the, the, the track and civil CREs to achieve what they need to achieve. So, and you know, different projects have adopted different ways to, to go about that. Um, one of those challenges uh, mentioned is also the time. So certainly on the existing network where somebody may want to do a track enhancement or, or refurbishment, um, time is, is always the, the driving criterion in terms of what it costs to have it and um, what it costs to deliver a solution and, and the efficiencies of building. Of course, from the, the, the actual materials delivery and, and, and cost, um, you want as long as you can, you can have, but that's that's not realistic these days. Um, so actually, the the bar to actually doing an effective ballast track installation is actually rising. Um, however, that also has driven um, the the use of of precast systems, modular systems, um, fast rapid setting concretes and grouts, um, and the real keys, as I've put on the on the bullet points there, are really designing for smart construction. So how can you actually have a design that's configured for the efficiency of that build and indeed delivery of the materials, you know, considering of sizes and weights of things and, and how they're, they're used. Um, and I confess we, we, we learn on every job um, how we can improve and do the next one even better. So um, so this is um, a section of the talk where I'm going to go through some recent um, projects going on on the continent. One's still underway and the other one's actually recently completed. Um, the first one I'm going to talk through is in Germany um, and the second in Switzerland and um, the first one has the luxury of being new build greenfield um, and has none of those time constraints other than obviously there'll be some contractual requirements there. Um, it is a section of line between the cities of Stuttgart and Ulm in southern Germany, where the existing line is very curvy. Um, the new line is a roughly 60 kilometer route and basically um, making it as straight as possible. Um, and that involves a number of tunnels as well as some bridges. Um, it does go under some, some uh, parts of uh, urban areas, so there's some also some uh, vibration mitigation solutions involved. Um, and it's quite a sort of mount mountainous area. Well, I guess they'd call it hilly, but um, uh, they're, they're quite big hills. Um, I have put a YouTube reference in there. I'm not um, going to play that um, for this project because um, it's not, not got as much detail as I have got another video for the other project. So just going to go through it with some pictures here. So we're doing this project with a, in a joint venture with a company called Switelski. Um, and just to give a flavour of, of some of the terrain, this is the, the biggest bridge on the project on the Filz Tower um, with a tunnel either side. Um, that's pretty spectacular and the bridges are now complete and track is being uh, installed on them. Um, most of the route, though, is either open route or um, tunnels. Um, this is a twin track tunnel. Tr tunnels less than a kilometre long on um, new build in Germany are done uh, twin track. Um, and when it's longer than that, they go for two single bores. Um, so here um, is the um, essentially the, the protection layer, the layer three that I mentioned before. That's that's delivered by the civils phase. Um, after that comes the foundation layer, slip former, that's the slip former being used um, and that's laying uh, an unreinforced concrete uh, which has a notch or saw cut put in it every few metres uh, and that's all about just managing the concrete shrinkage without um, reinforcing it. Um, you can see some strips on it, those are actually in lieu of rollers for pulling rail along. Uh, and you can see down the side the bundles of, of sleepers uh, laid ready. Uh, in this case, they've got the um, the OLE masts already set up. That was already delivered first. That's also part of the contract. Um, and then here's a few slides taking you through the the work steps. So the 
the, the sleepers are laid out, um, reinforcement threaded, rails uh, thimbled on, and then the final alignment can begin. Um, final alignment um, is actually to the left of this bit. I'll, I've got a couple of other pictures. Um, don't show too much on the final alignment. Um, that looked like one big beer tent, um, but it was actually um, designed to keep the sun off uh, as they had to work through the, the hot summer. Um, the workers needed a bit of protection. So you've got some finished track on the right and on the left, you can see the temporary work. So having having got the um, the all the components in, the rails on, uh, the fine alignment work starts, uh, which in this case uses uh, trolleys and, and total stations and that kind of stuff. Um, and then the temporary works are fitted, so with what, what we would call road forms down the side um, and attached to the fixing brackets um, go the lateral adjustment and fixing um, devices. Um, they're set every every third um, sleeper and uh, allow horizontal fine tuning and they also have a vertical spindle which I'd hoped that would be visible but I'm not convinced it's visible on that picture. Um, this just shows a picture above so you can see um, ahead of times so that's where the, the various pieces are being fitted out and the fine alignment will be being done. Uh, and then the, the, the linear factory comes along with the, uh, the concrete supply um, and the tent. Uh, in this case, it's road rail supply. When they were building the, the, this line, that would have been um, with rubber tyre plants. Um, there's the guys busy at work underneath. So um, this is where, um, you know, a bit of care and attention and, and some, some um, um, concrete workers are required to still finish the finish the concrete to the to the quality required. And when they're done, along come things like the wiring train to do the other parts of the railway systems, cable laying, signalling installation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and I'm I'm now going to go through one particular location, which which um, might be interesting to see. Um, this is. A location where there's actually a station to be built. So the route go, follows along a motorway. I think this is what we'd term a park and ride location. So it's it's for Merklingen station and Merklingen is either very very small or somewhere else nearby. Um, you can see that there's a tunnel portal at the top of the picture um, but the, the route is uh, ideal for sort of coming off the motorway and, and um, uh, doing a bit of a park and ride rather than driving the whole way. Well, I think one of the photographs somewhere shows a traffic jam on the motorway, which probably illustrates the reason why. Um, so the Sybils works um, through that, obviously line side drainage, battering of slopes, um, all being underway. That was a couple of years back. Um, got dates on from, from quite a lot of these pictures. So that was um, March 2019. Um, after that, the, the start of the station uh, here, walkways there, um, lift shafts um, and various bases being put in. Uh, that was April 2019. By August, they've got the, the masts in for the OLE um, and the formation is being cleared ready. Um, by the following April, the track guys have got there and, and they're now um, Starting to, to slip form the the base layers for the the foundation layer for the for the track. The sleepers have been delivered, um, and it's all systems go for the track. Uh, that's a view from the other end, um, showing the the slip forming as it's progressed. Uh, done the, the the platform track or part of it, and they're starting to do the through road, um, and that's it. A little bit further on uh, in the July, by the July, the base layers are all in, and um, it's probably a, a slip form was working its way further along. Um, and the first junction has actually been fitted and cast and getting ready to do the next ones. Um, this is a sort of a, a flyover view. I'm pretty sure that was taken by drone. Um, you can see the, the box outs that have been left for the swing nose crossing actuations, because that's a high speed through turnout. Uh, through turn I'm not sure what speed it is, but the line speed is 250. So I assume it can take that. Um, and on the other line, it's being set up ready. So you can see our temporary work system, uh, which is called ROSAS, which has been set up alongside the, um, the, the standard 
uh, road forms. Um, this this allows holding of the of the complex rail parts for the for the um, in this in this part obviously the swing nose crossing elsewhere it's obviously to turn out and, and so on. Uh, and you can see also the surveyors at work doing their um, measurement through uh, prior to concreting. And that's what it looks like when finished, um, ready for the uh, the OLE guys to come in um, and the other parts of the railway systems. Um, the track team will be now well underway somewhere else. That was October last year. Um, and the latest picture which um, I've got on the system, um, all of which are all available, by the way, on the Deutsche Bahn website for this project. Um, this was July and it looks like they're now um, building the um, uh, the station car park. Um, sadly, it looks like they've removed the wood that was on the, um, the first picture. Maybe they'll replant something, who knows. So that was a bit of a, a rapid run through um, life on a high speed project. Um, what's a little bit different um, here is a, a project in Switzerland. Um, and actually the focus of this project isn't really track. Track is a means to an end here. Um, this um, is a very picturesque line. Um, some people may know it. Sure to St. Moritz is through the one of the prettiest parts of the Alps. Um, it's actually narrow gauge um, and the tunnels are uh, well naturally old. It's quite an old line, um, Victorian era type stuff. Um, rock lines, um, but the tunnels are old and need a lot of attention. Um, just to reinforce where we are in the world, um, this uh, is the, the map of Switzerland. It's in the, the southeast corner, uh, which is basically full of mountains. Um, and this line goes from St. Moritz, winds its way through the tunnel. There's a, there's a big tunnel called the Albula Tunnel, but there's a number of other smaller tunnels. And um, we've been involved in a couple of projects already where they're uh, trying to refurbish. The Albula Tunnel, I think, is being completely rebored. But the um, the other smaller tunnels they they need to refurbish. Um, okay, so why? Well, just like a lot of tunnels, there's water ingress, there's some deformation going on, there's some heave going on, um, and the real challenge is that you know other than the expense of boring a new tunnel, um, which you know in that part of the world is well, well they do like their tunnels for Swiss, but but it's an expensive game. Um, line closures are a problem because just like for us um you know they don't like to close the line for for, for weeks on end um and you know they they like to reline the the, the tunnels so that's what they've come up with as a, as a standard solution um but what they have been basically trying to achieve is is a solution that allows traffic to still flow in the day which is quite a challenge when you combine that with a relining so the original solution is a precast uh, modular relining, um, keeping the ballasted track in place um, with a number of stages involved to achieve that. Um, they came up with a method of doing that with a temporary uh, track system on which they could run um, a tunnel shield um, around which they could work uh, to break out, um, stabilize and reline. And the, the final solution, um, was to use a, a track slab, which became a permanent track slab, which means that they've now got a low maintenance track, um, having also sorted out uh, drainage and cabling and, and um, given themselves basically a completely new asset um, in all respects. So uh, they seem to be very pleased with that. And uh, if I now change screens, I will show a, a presentation, which is actually available on YouTube. There's the link. Uh, that's a link to the client's page as well, uh, and I believe that the slides will be available afterwards. So just bear with me while I swap screens. And I'll play the video. Hopefully this all works. So you're now seeing that screen. So. I'll... so... Simulation rather than real photographs. And it shows the work steps involved, which are quite significant. So, first off, you've got the um, 
um, the testing line with its OA already in there. Um, track is removed. And what this image doesn't show is all the clever planting rods, and we've got some slides that show that a little bit more. So, um, so firstly, excavation as needed, um, then cable laying, then the track slab system put in effectively in, as a temporary measure. So, so the base plates that are put in there um, are adjustable, significantly adjustable, um, and then some precast elements put on top of them to allow uh, tracked and rubber tire plants to be used. And then the uh, traction beam um, LED system is put in, which can be um, adjusted a little bit easier and fits in the tight environment of the, of the tunnel tube. Then you will now see some additional uh, shield rail being put in down the side. Um, and the images there are trying to show um, basically drilling in to, to widen the tunnel. So the section of work for the night is established with the shield divided. The beam is put back up and trains can run. Then overnight again, and well, some actually in some cases during the day, the workers can work behind the shield. But when they prepared for the, the real night works, um, which in this case involved um, explosive work because it's rock, but there's also areas where they've um, done um, rock bolting and um, stabilization. Some protection layers put in and a protective curtain put up. Then the blasting process happens. That material is then removed. Sorry, I had a message saying that the, the audio was a pain. Um, so hopefully you can hear me a little bit better now. Um, so once the the section with the tunnel enlarged has been complete, um, we then lay line side drainage, um, concrete that in, or and then put a put a foundation layer for the tunnel linings on top. Then in comes the train with the modular tunnel linings, and we have a nice little um, tunnel lining device which can lay the, um, the modular tunnel linings. All designed to do enough as what you can do for, for the night shift in order to be able to then open again in the day. Um, that having been done, the conductor beam gets replaced. Further cable ducting and walkways are put in, um, and we're ready to move on to the next section. Well, they, they do grout behind it as well to seal it up, um, and that's the final section for that. So that's done in sort of segments all the way through the tunnel. In this case, this tunnel was only 300 and something meters long, so um, not the longest tunnel in the world. The final section is um, putting in the final base plate system. So we can now do a final alignment and uh, fix the track slabs and fix the rails in exactly the right place for a nice smooth line. Um, so that can all be tidied up. Um, the, the sequence of rail removal there, not quite how it's done. Um, you have to manage around the rail. Um, but nevertheless, that is the last process which was completed this year. And the final step is that actually finished off by, by putting a, a conventional OLE system in, not the conductor beam. So um, it rounds off the rounds off the system. So I think that is enough of that, and I will switch back again.
There we go. Okay. So, um, so you get a bit of a flavour of, of what they were achieving there, which actually is basically a new tunnel, um, old tunnel into new. Um, so that simulation looked great. So, you know, what does it look like in reality? Well, the reality is an awful lot of work, obviously, in preparing. Um, you need to understand your geology. There's some um, mining type skills involved. There's the precast concrete design of the track slab, which um, was done by um, a partner company for us. Um, there's all the surveying and scanning and, and um, imagining of, and creating of all the logistics chains. Um, we use um, Clever Plant with integrated conveyors um, called the ITC. That's the machine there with the big headlights excavating away. There's a track slab going in. Um, if you can imagine trying to get enough of a section done in a night shift, um, that's quite a lot of intensive work. Um, as I understand it, um, we're, we're only looking at, at the length of a number of track slabs uh, per night when they're doing the excavation process. Um, uh, with, the, with the time window they had available, but nevertheless, um, that process was was designed uh, according to the logistics available. In this case, we could um, remove material at one end and we could deliver precast elements from the other. Um, one of the real challenges was at the end was low temperature grouting. So um, the grouts used for the track at the end, um, the original grout selected uh, wouldn't work at the temperatures in the tunnel. So we actually had to do some development work with a supplier and, and come up with something that would um, set at the, the very low temperatures that were there, which we're talking minus two um, with a constant wind blowing through the tunnel through the Alps. And here's some images of, of, of what it's really looking like. So, you know, the, the um, you know, the reality is, of course, when you are doing a bit of drill and blast work, you have got uh, rubble. There is stuff to tidy up. Um, but the tunnel shield works. Um, looks very neat. They had a, um, a number of months where the track form was was run on as a track slab, but hadn't been effectively cast in place yet. It was the final fix was only done at the very end. Um, uh, but the the tunnel shields are all there, sort of mining technology to to sort of protect workers, protect um, equipment, and ultimately to protect trains um, during the day um, and then this whole system moves forward as progress is made. Um, slightly tidier part where we're sort of doing the, the, the lining, um, showing the, 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 um, the segment director arm, um, and then also on the flatback wagons, uh, we had a, a mini um, cherry picker for staff to be able to reach the top. You don't want to be using the ladders for everything. Um, and obviously erecting the, um, the overhead line equipment as well. And there's a train running. Um, actually, this one is just delivering the, the, the precast elements, but uh, I don't actually have a picture of a, um, um, of a passenger train running. And um, I'm now going to do a bit of a run through on U UK projects. So um, hopefully that Swiss example is an interesting one of a different way of um, making use of, of Ballister's track for a, um, a very good end for the for the asset owner. Um, recent and current projects. So th this this really is a, a very short summary. So this is an image of the trains running through Kings Cross Gasworks Tunnel East Bore. Um, you can't actually see it, but there is slab track from roughly where my cursor is now. Um, the, the work which I alluded to before was, um, in our case, we started at uh, Form A and supported um, the designer and, and um, then the um, um, principal contractor as, as a specialist slab track, firstly designer and then builder. Um, there's some image from the sort of the BIM work that was done, um, 3D design in track, full structural solution, um, which was um, certainly a learning curve for myself. Uh, and that's now become something we do as standard. Um, and this is the, the solution which the track complete, um, the AOLE and the cabling uh, following us um, to come in there. So that included also um, uh, a crossover at, um, at the end, actually, so it's behind me as the photograph looks here. Um, 
and the track system here is a precast as i mentioned before a 2.1 meter wide one which um, really does have some use in our tight infrastructure um, and here's another one um, i was on site there yesterday this is barking riverside extension so this is another new build one so um, a little bit few and far between in the uk for these kind of things uh, and this shows uh, new track slab on largely on elevated structures and um, we're delivering this as part of a design and build contract to the principal contract of Morgan Tindall um, Volker Fitzpatrick uh, for Transport for London. Ultimately Network Rail will take over the asset um, and again uh, everything designed um, with, with BIM and the models in mind um, and the solution is looking very nice now. Here's another one. Um, this is one that we're st currently planning with, working with CRSA and Atkins um, on. Um, still early stage design at the moment, but another example of, of um, the type of use that slab track can be made um, for, which is sort of gauge clearance, track lowering, um, and the classic challenges are, you know, what do you do with the foundations? Where's the tunnel invert? Where are the, where's the drainage going to go? Um, but it's another use potentially for the narrow precast um, slab track. Um, here's another one which um, is a, a different um, scenario, but that's that's we do have a legacy of some old slab tracks in in um, in Britain, um, slip form paved um, concrete track with the rails laid with continuous support. Um, a fair bit of that was done in the 70s and 80s. Um, a lot of it's now getting towards the end of life. Um, Often it's drainage that's causing the end of life. Um, it's quite a wet tunnel. The track slab's not in perfect condition now and the substructures are not either with some drainage issues. Um, we undertook some drainage emergency repair work last year. Um, and this year we've done some work basically doing a feasibility study on how it might be um, refurbished, replaced. Um, and um, I think that is now scheduled to take place over the next couple of years, uh, hopefully resulting in a, a new asset for the track um, with um, drainage and um, associated um, assets taken care of as well. There's quite a lot of cables run which aren't shown in the, in the model here, but there's quite a lot of um, cables running down the side as well which have to be taken care of. So that's the, the, the kind of work we're now doing. Uh, feasibility stage that's very much in in conjunction with survey scanning uh, generation of models looking at options um, and then turning them into um, the the ideally the, the the right and most effective uh, solution for the for the asset owner and um, to suit their constraints and we can support that whole planning process all the way through and I think that is just about wrapping it up and giving a little bit of time for some questions. Um, I have to do a bit of thanks and acknowledgements. There's a few slides in there that are courtesy of other people. Um, and thanks to clients, uh, Network Rail, TfL, uh, the Rettische Bahn, Deutsche Bahn, um, um, one or two other companies whose, whose images I've used. Um, so I will draw that to a conclusion um, and say thank you for listening. and. Um, if there's any questions, I'm happy to try and answer them. Guys, yeah, please feel free to ask ask a question yourself or pop one in the post. Can I ask a question, uh, Barnaby? Can you hear me? Sure, yes. Um, the term hydraulically bound layer, can you explain in a bit of detail what that actually means? Yes. What does hydraulically it, bound mean? Yes, basically, basically it, it turns um, what would be a, a standard fill into what is effectively a concrete by adding a material that uses water, as in the hydraulic bit, uh, as a binder. So essentially that means a low strength concrete. Um, there is a term that's now probably better used, which is um, CBGM, cement bound granular material which is what the the name of the standard that governs it is called um, and 
that allows a whole range of different strengths of, of or amounts of binder uh, used to be um, managed. So um, that covers everything from something that's really is a very, very um, low strength, a couple of percent of, of cement all the way through to something that you'd call a roller compacted concrete. Okay, thank you. I understand that better now. Okay, you're welcome. Yeah, sorry, go, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, Liz. Oh, right, thanks. Sorry, sorry for speaking over. Um, hi, Barnaby. Just a question from me. My experience in slab tracks quite limited, really, but what experience have got is is based towards train care depots, of which I've done a few of over the last few years. And on those, we've had to provide a proprietary track slab system for the carriage wash and fueling aprons. And um, the first couple we did, we really struggled to find something that met all the requirements. And we ended up using the Sonneville system, which I'm, to this day, I'm not convinced it's maybe the most appropriate system. I was just wondering if you've got any experience in suitable systems for short pieces of slab tracking depots? Um, <laughs> um, that, that's probably something that merits a, um, a sort of a technical discussion outside. I, I'm sure there are um, a number of solutions. I can, I can understand why you might think that, it, so for everybody else's benefit, the, the Sonneville um, solution is a booted, uh, rubber booted block system. So if you're using it in a kind of wash down uh, carriage wash road, um, then you can imagine the rubber elements potentially going to get a lot more water in them than just in their sort of, if it was being used out in an open route section where it, you know it's deemed okay, um, but maybe not ideal if there's uh, you know an ex extra amount of water um, that's going to be used. Um, I'm sure there'll be a, a range of other different ways of doing it, um, and. It, it wouldn't just be about the bit carrying the rails that I would be interested in discussing. It would be, okay, well, what's outside of that? Um, how does that link to where the drains actually have to run? Um, you know, how is your program constrained in terms of building it, you know, in terms of access and stuff? Does that, does that dictate that doing something using precast elements makes more sense because it's quicker or does it mean, um, you know, uh, a different form of, of base plate system sitting on an in-situ slab. Uh, I, I couldn't I couldn't tell you the, the exact answer because it will depend on the circumstance, but um, would be more than happy to help um, if you have another uh, Yeah, thanks. thanks. Uh, uh, may I, uh, I, have, I have a question about, um, about the ground. You, uh, in your presentation, you uh, mentioned that the ground is uh, very important. Uh, it's a very important aspect. Uh, this uh, standard 16432, uh, 2017, uh, it says that uh, the ground support has to be designed, uh, the earthwork has to be designed as per uh, Eurocode 1997. Uh, the question is, when you are, you are when, when we are working on ballastless tracks on ground in the open, and where you're doing renewal per se, uh, how can we make sure that the ground below that is already designed to year 1997? <laughs> yeah, that's a very good question. And the answer is that's very difficult because of course, uh, certainly nine times out of 10 on an existing line here, it won't have done because the standard wouldn't have existed. Um, and even if it, if it was designed to to some standard, which in in I guess in the case of some of the Victorian embankments we've got, uh, probably not. Um, no, you you have to you have to think about it in a slightly different way. So um, it's more about figuring out what is the strength that you have got there, and what is the effectively to be as efficient as you can. What is the minimum intervention you can take to cap it in order to effectively support a ballastless solution, um, and indeed. That can actually dictate the impossibility of um, ballastless solutions uh, in places, um, and it's what drives drives a no decision when you're comparing what your options are if the ground is particularly difficult. Um, so it does it, it does depend on circumstance. Um, there's usually a way to do it, um, and there's always a, a battle between 
big depth and um, amount of materials needed versus sophistication of materials used. So, um, you know, there's always a way. It's a question of trying to figure out what the optimum way is. Does that Thanks. does that help? It's, it's not yes, an easy answer. <laughs> Thanks. Um, there's a question on the chat from somebody called Ishmael um, about asking how you would go about choosing a ballastless system. Um, well, that's our bread and butter. That's what we do, um, um, if not every day, at least every month, um, from from different inquiries, from different opportunities, from different challenges uh, thrown at us from from a variety of customers and circumstances um, across our, our business, which um, is a bit of a, a ballastless track specialist, not just in the UK, but, but um, in the German speaking world and, and wider afield as well. So it's, it's um, we, we basically have to take account of all the constraints. So the constraints are your, your availability of time. Um, does it have to be delivered in, in midweek night possessions? On the odd weekend or you know is it possible to have um, longer periods of time at any point what's the access um, what's the ground if it's a tunnel is there a tunnel invert there's a whole set of different things um, ge geometrically what's the space available um, these are all things that we have to take account before we make a recommendation and we'll probably assess a number of what we think are feasible options in order to try and analyze down to what we would recommend and and usually in the end that recommendation is is not just a here you go it's a uh, it's a discussion with with the customer as to you know what they feel suits them best too hopefully that that helps you a little bit but definitely the trend is towards precast hi Barnaby can I can I uh, ask a question please oh. sure yes yeah. Going. Um, with with uh, alignment, um, so you've, you've got the clamps and the devices for, for horizontal and vertical alignment. What what's mm -hmm. your on on? I, I guess it changes depending which system you're using. But what's what's your expectation on uh, accuracy of the finished job once you've poured the, the final um, grout or cement in? Well, and, and, and is it, does that meet the requirements of, of of every operator, or do you have to do a uh, an initial grinding shift after you've done the pour. Um, so taking it stage wise, so so in order to get the final rail, the rails in the final position um, in accordance with with um, what the aspiration is, which uh, I would say there is a there is a page a table in two one o two which um, gives you some tolerances that which you mm -hmm. need to be. For, for, for ballast track build. However, those really should be understood as minimum requirements, not not targets. Uh, but um, yeah, in order to achieve that, there's there's tolerances at every stage of work. Um, and then when you're positioning the track at the, at the end, um, it does partly depend on which system you use. Some are heavier than others and get adjusted in different ways. So if you're adjusting a precast, it's different to if you're adjusting a sleeper type system um, mm. and we have a system which is even lighter because you're only adjusting um, um, non-metallic base plates so um, all these have different characteristics and, and, and so on the actual geometry you're trying to deal with is also relevant so are you in a curve are you on yeah. a gradient um, have you got a, a nice convenient tunnel wall to push off or do you have to create um, some sort of um, system to to push from if you're adjusting horizontally um, then you've got to take account of um, temperature um, yeah. and your survey setup is pretty crucial as well so you have to understand um, both the equipment you're using it's got to be the right equipment and it's got to have the right uh, control setup and those controls better be checked um, on a regular basis because you know if somebody nudged something which did happen on a project it did lead to some 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 deviations in tolerances, which um, the whole project only realised afterwards. So you know, we when we went back and judged it, yeah, the, the alignment was was a few millimetres wider than or different to to 
what it should have been per design. Uh, so all those aspects are critical to achieving it. Um, so having said that, when you look at the alignment of some of our uh, of our work, it really it does look very very smooth, um, yeah. and we are, we are usually exceeding the standards by a decent margin. Um, I have to say, when you um, if I go back a couple of slides um, to this one, um, if I look down the line, well, the rails aren't on the one on the left, but the one on the right, the alignment is very very smooth. However some of the challenges on that project are pretty crucial because uh, it's a viaduct and we all know that bridges expand and contract and the laws of physics apply and when we're doing that on a curve when you've set your geometry and you think you've got everything in the right place and then the sun comes up and through the day the bridge extends the rails want to push your temporary works had better be up to it or or um or you're gonna you know the alignment's going to change while you're working so yeah. these things have to be accounted for in in getting it right and managing those tolerances is just an ongoing process because you know you can say you can get it to the nearest millimeter but what does that mean if your tolerance on your survey equipment is 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 only a millimeter or two um two millimeters about, yeah yeah it's about get it, achieving smoothness you know it's for me it's it's as much about um the rate of change in the in the sort of a 10 or 20 meter cord as it is um, achieving a perfect vertical profile or a perfect horizontal profile. Mm -hmm. um, obviously there's tolerances on that and you want to keep to that. And plus you, you know, you get into a station platform or something like that, um, then there's other requirements that apply. Um, but um, it should be that you achieve a, a, a permanent alignment that is um, you know, good for a train to negotiate. And, and it, you don't often have to do a, a uh, a grinding shift then before the line's handed to the client. No, uh, well, that would be a severe exception if that had to happen. Yeah. Other than for removing that layer or something. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a really good answer. Thank you. I'm just conscious of time and that people need to get back to work. So um, um, if we just um, basically do some thanks and then if anybody wants to stay on and ask Barnaby any questions, that'd be great. But before everyone drops off. Um, Roy, can you, can you say a few words, please? Yeah, uh, many thanks, Barnaby, for, for uh, what was a whistle-stop tour of, of slab track. Uh, it's something that I, I feel we're going to see more and more of in an industry, and rightly so. Uh, it's had challenges over the years. It's been a battle uh, to, to justify uh, OPEX or CAPEX against OPEX, uh, but we seem now to be meeting those challenges more and more and we're getting smarter and smarter with what we do with slab. Uh, LUL have made some great progress. Okay, they, they perhaps don't do an awful lot in a shift, but when you think it's a four hour shift and they do five meters of, of concrete slab, it, it, it's pretty good what they do. Uh, and the, the Things that you're doing with, but not just within Sursa, but slab worldwide is is fantastic. I was lucky enough to be involved in high speed line in the Netherlands, uh, and also the the slab track we did in the UK at Presbury and Hibble Road on West Coast, which also used Radar 2000 system. So no, it, it it's great. Uh, one thing I would like to do is uh, just before I finish is press you to to come back and give us another talk at some point on how you manage the transition between slab and ballast and how you uh, retain stress as you just said or, or hi highlighted to on the viaduct between the slab and the rail i think those are two interesting areas as well that, that we need some more understanding of uh, so if you're short of papers to write uh, maybe you'd like to think about the, the importance of the transition slab uh, and the the stress uh, and maintaining the relationship between the slab and the rail stress. But thanks very much for, for your insight, Barney, and uh, it's been really useful to, to understand uh, a bit more about slab. And I'd like to thank you for presenting both to uh, the section and also for allowing your presentation to be put in there so others of a wider audience uh, can see it. And if we could just turn on your microphones and give uh, Barnaby a round of thanks. That'll be really good. 
Thank you. Thank you.